Joanne Braxton, our first speaker, is the Cummings Professor at the College of William & Mary in Williamburg, Williamsburg, Virginia. She is an award-winning teacher and writer whose books include Black Women Writing Autobiography, Monuments of the Black Atlantic, Slavery and Memory, The Maya Angelou, I Know Why the Cade Bird Sings Reader, Sometimes I Think of Maryland, a Collection of Poetry, and the play Crossing Deep River. Many of us in this room are particularly indebted to her for her edition of the complete poems of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, whose illuminating introduction did so much to jumpstart the renewed interest in Dunbar that this conference embodies. I'm delighted that she'll be giving the inaugural paper, whose title is Dunbar, the Originator. Please join me in welcoming Professor Braxton. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you, Shelley. Um, like everyone else, I will try to keep my paper to 15 minutes. However, I cannot resist reading an excerpt that was just handed to me by Everett Hoagland from George Moses Horton, myself. My genius from a boy has fluttered like a bird within my heart but could not thus confine her powers, but could not thus confine her powers employ, impatient to depart. She, like a restless bird, would spread her wing, her power to be unfurled, and let her songs be loudly heard and dart from world to world. I thought ultimately that the paper needed a more descriptive title. And so I would call it now, Seeing the Life and Work of Paul Lawrence Dunbar in Fresh, fresh Context. And what an honor to be given the first place as the accidental Dunbar scholar that I came to be simply because I could not get copies of the then out of print, complete poems for my students. The result, as we now know, is the collected poetry of Paul Lawrence Dunbar reviewed in American literature as the largest collection of Dunbar's poetry yet published, including some poems from earlier volumes omitted from the 1913 volume, poems published in periodicals but never collected, and some previously unpublished poems from the Paul Lawrence Dunbar collection in the Ohio Historical Society. This labor of love produced a work, work distinct from the original, a usable text for teaching and research, readily available at a reasonable price. In this continuum and in recognizing the centenary of the 33 year span that might fairly be called the Dunbar era. We stand on the shoulders of Benjamin Brawley, Charles T. Davis, J. Saunders Redding, Darwin Turner, Arna Bonetomps, Addison Gale, J. Martin, Gossie Hudson, Peter Revell, and yes, even William Dean Howells, among others who left their indelible, if sometimes controversial, marks on Dunbar scholarship. And we say thank you to these who went before, because Mr. Dunbar, who understood and appreciated John Keats' concept of negative capability, would want it that way. For within the scope of all our aspirations, successes, and failings, there is that romantic ideal, as Keats wrote in a letter to his brothers, of negative capability. That is, when man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason." End quote. From this position of being first, a position of honor and privilege, 
I suggest three goals. First, that we keep Dunbar at the center of our critical discourse over the next two days and not become so impressed with our own scholarly paraphernalia <laughs> that we become incapable of being in uncertainty, mystery, and doubt. That we enter instead that space of possibility working from moment to moment in the spirit of cooperation, collaboration, and celebration. Secondly, I advocate that we advance living modes of commemorating Dunbar, who has been compared, first by Howells and then by Langston Hughes and others, to the Scottish poet Robert Burns. Burns, despite his humble beginnings on his father's farm, was virtually a saint to Keats, Dunbar's favorite romantic poet and to others who made spiritual pilgrimages to his tomb. Scots around the world celebrate Rabbi Burns Day on January 25th of each year with a ritual supper that includes haggis, bagpipes, readings of Burns' work, the singing of Old Dang Syne, and of course, Scotch whiskey. At least 872 Burns celebrations throughout the world each year. 676 in Scotland, attended by as many as 1,000 people each. And as many as 3,000 in attendance in New York City alone. Should we not celebrate Dunbar with poetry slams and dandelion wine? wherever we multicultured versifiers may find ourselves on June 27th, Paul Lawrence Dunbar Day. And thirdly, what about a Paul Lawrence Dunbar society and journal, both for the advancing of Dunbar scholarship and also to stimulate and create audiences for black and experimental poetry in the 21st century. We need Dunbar academies where younger poets learn to read Dunbar's verse and to feel with their bodies from the inside out the connections between the old and the new. 